What's up and welcome back to the Alex Loroff Media YouTube channel, which is me. I am Alex Loroff. Shockingly enough, coming at you with a second video this week. As I said in my What If Episode 8 review, I want to try to do these videos a little bit more often, especially if there's a lot of cool stuff coming out and a lot of stuff to talk about coming out in the nerdy world, the MCU world, DC world, things of that nature. And there is certainly a lot to talk about coming up throughout the rest of this year. So this is another video this week, and this video is going to be talking about Venom, Let There Be Carnage. I literally just got out of the theater, drove back to my apartment, and sat down to record just as instant of a reaction as I possibly could after seeing this movie. And I wanted to talk about just my initial thoughts of the film, the implications of the massive post credit scene as well, and just an overall discussion about some issues I might see going forward when it comes to the Sony movies, when it comes to the MCU, and what the future might hold with everything that's being kind of tossed up in the air right now and currently being juggled between the two studios and between the multiple different universes we have going on. So if you want to hear more about my thoughts on all the nerdy stuff coming up in the next few weeks, next few months, we have uh, DC Fandom coming up in a couple of weeks. Going to try and do a video about that. We have the What If Season finale coming up next week. That'll be a video as well, hopefully, if I can you know, sit down, watch it, record a video as well about that. Uh, Eternals comes out in a few weeks. I saw the trailer once again before Venom here tonight, so my hype level is continuing to build for Eternals. We have Hawkeye coming out in November. We have Spider-Man No Way Home, the big one in December. I've also been keeping up with Titans Season 3. I'm going to try to have a video about that once I watch the season finale and do a season recap. The Book of Boba Fett comes out in December. I'm going to try and do some videos about that as well because I'm also not as big a Star Wars fan as others, but I do like some of the Star Wars Disney Plus stuff, so a lot coming up in the next few weeks and months. So if you want to keep in touch with all my thoughts on everything nerdy, uh, subscribe to this channel. I'm going to try to make it a little more more regular of a routine to post videos, post my thoughts on things, and hopefully you have some thoughts as well and want to comment below and just start a discussion about all these different kind of movies, TV shows, and things going on in the nerdy world. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Venom, Let There Be Carnage. This is going to be full spoilers. The movie does come out officially tomorrow, again, to, to date this video, but oh well. Uh, I saw it here on Thursday night in Lacrosse at my local Marcus Cinema, which has been my go-to for movies throughout this year. This is the fourth film I've seen in theaters so far this year, along with Suicide Squad, Shang-Chi, and Black Widow. And initially, I was not going to bother at all seeing Venom, Let There Be Carnage. I saw the first Venom... I don't think I saw it in theaters. I might have just caught it after the fact on VOD, something like that. But I don't remember going to a theater to see Venom. Just because the reviews weren't great, the word of mouth wasn't great, and when I ended up seeing the movie, I really didn't like it all that much, to be completely honest. I wasn't a huge fan of just how it was structured, and the Tom Hardy performance kind of caught me off guard right off the bat, how he played Eddie Brock, and the weird relationship between... Eddie and Venom, it took me a little bit to kind of understand, okay, this is just what this relationship is going to be, that's what that movie was going for, and it's kind of accepted for what it was, which they definitely doubled down on in Let There Be Carnage, but because I wasn't really a fan of the first Venom, I had really no interest at all in seeing this movie, until word started coming out about a massive post credit scene, which had big implications for the future of a lot of different things. So, literally, the word of a post credit scene is what sent me to the theaters, sat my ass down in the seat, and see let Venom Let There Be Carnage. And I think this is the first time ever that a post credit scene has sold me a ticket, personally. And I think that's going to be the case for a lot of people this weekend, because there's been so much made about, you know, there is, there's this massive post credit scene. And even some of the marketing of Let There Be Carnage has been talking about this post credit scene that, like, changes everything. Which I think is the first time I've ever seen a post credit scene be part of an official marketing campaign to try and get people to the theaters to see it. Obviously, post credit scenes have sort of been the thing since the first Iron Man movie, sort of establishing the whole post credit scene in films or making it a consistent part of films and an important part of superhero films, especially moving forward. And now we're kind of seeing the zenith of that almost, where a post credit scene is like the most exciting part of this movie. Because overall, I thought this movie was fine, it was okay, not great, 
but it wasn't like egregiously awful. Like this wasn't this was not a you know like X Men Origins Wolverine or a you know early two thousand superhero film like the first Ghost Rider or like Fantastic Four or like the two thousand three Hulk. Like it's not in the like you know bottom tier of like superhero films but there's such a glut like in the middle of just kind of superhero films over the years and i think venom let there be carnage is squarely just in that you know middle mid-tier range of yeah it was fine it was okay nothing that i would say is particularly you know great or transcendent but it's, it's only an hour and a half which i think is part of the problem as well though with the film but it only being an hour and a half kind of lends itself to you know it's not going to Take up too much of your day if you want to just go sit down in a theater, kind of have a, a fun time with the movies, just seeing two big just kind of monsters just fight each other on screen or whatever. You're going to have a good time with that, but if you try to look for like a deeper meaning or kind of deeper context to this film, there really isn't any. Um, this almost just kind of felt like a means to an end just to sort of, A, make another Venom movie because the first one did surprisingly well worldwide at the box office, and B, just kind of get Carnage on screen and have the first live adaptation of the Carnage character. So it felt like it means to an end in a lot of ways, and the hour and a half runtime kind of played to that, where it felt, it went really, it moved at a clip. Like, you're not lingering on one scene for too long, especially in the first, you know, kind of hour of the movie. The only, like, extended set piece or extended scene is kind of the final fight in the church between Venom and and Carnage, and all the side characters sort of all kind of go into that orbit as well, and you get sort of the one big final kind of climactic set piece. Otherwise, it's a very quick pace to kind of get to that point, and you don't spend too long on one idea or the next just to sort of get us through this movie, basically. Positives of the film, I thought, uh, as much as the Venom-Eddie Brock kind of relationship caught me off guard a little bit in the first movie now that i understand what they're going for with that relationship and again they really double down on it here in this one i really by the end of the movie bought into this true symbiotic relationship between venom and eddie it is still goofy as hell don't get me wrong it is still very kind of screwball goofball comedy kind of style partnership between eddie and venom and i found myself at a couple points during this movie actually you know not minding the humor especially with venom venom is very much a comedic character in this movie even more so than the first one in this movie they really go all in on venom is kind of cracking jokes being goofy um you know wanting to eat everyone just wanting to do his own thing wanting to you know not be a loser as he says in the first movie uh and some of it worked some of it didn't I thought the funniest scene in the movie, the one that actually like really got me was uh, there was a point in this movie where Anne, Michelle Williams' character, who was uh, Eddie's fiance from the first movie, uh, in this one she like meets Eddie for dinner to say that you know she's marrying her current boyfriend or whatever, like Dan. I think he was in the first one, but I don't remember. Um, and then the next day, to like Eddie's kind of down in the dumps to cheer Eddie up. Venom is like ma trying to make him breakfast while singing like. Uh, you what is the song you do you say that's called the whole thing whatever that song is called he's singing a song like terribly he's making breakfast like it's just so absurd like that scene of like venom just kind of just like, talk singing and trying to make breakfast and spilling shit all over the place and things are on fire in the kitchen and like coffee's going on the floor and eddie's just kind of sitting there just at the table really despondent while venom's just going all over the place trying to make a breakfast and being that actually got me just for the absurdity of just that scene i'm like it, it actually that was pretty funny but then it goes also in the complete opposite direction where Venom at one point ends up at a rave randomly where he and Eddie have a falling out, which I thought was actually a really good scene, how it was structured with kind of Eddie and Venom's big falling out and Venom just kind of beating up Eddie around their apartment and like throwing stuff out the window. Like I thought that was a really good scene, like how it was put together. But then Venom just kind of jumps from body to body to body, just trying to kind of do his own thing and he ends up at like a super elaborate rave with crazy like costumes and everyone thinks like oh nice costume man like it's just venom himself just kind of hanging out with all these weird people at a rave and he has like this big speech like on a microphone 
where he takes the mic away from like some girl who was like rapping there and he has this whole big like diatribe about like i'm cool i can be my own man people like me like very bizarre while he's covered in glow sticks it's just a very odd visual of venom with like 10 glow sticks on him like just kind of talking to all these people like at a rave the fact that that scene was in there is just a very interesting decision from director Andy Serkis. And the fact that, like, we go back to that... It wasn't just, like, a one-off. Like, we go back to there a couple points where that's, like, a main part of the movie is, like, Venom at this rave for some reason. Uh, so it kind of goes in both directions. Uh, but overall, I think by the end of the movie, you do really buy into the relationship between Eddie and Venom. And they do kind of make you... Uh, believe in the fact that like they need one another that venom on his own just doesn't work without eddie and eddie on his own is just is kind of a loser and like he doesn't really kind of venom kind of helps out eddie through his life and eddie gives venom purpose basically in being here on earth and like it does pay off at the end when they're fighting against carnage when it gets to the point where you know eddie tells venom like they're not symbiotic because carnage is had doing his own thing while cletus cassidy uh doesn't want him to do the thing he's doing which is you know killing his girlfriend or whatever so you do get that sense of like okay these two work well together and i think overall it's more good than bad when it comes to that relationship specifically on the other side venom let there be carnage so the carnage character cletus cassidy uh in a very just I think bad performance from Woody Harrelson. I like Woody Harrelson, and especially in the beginning of the movie, they were, I think, trying to go with a little bit of, like, Natural Born Killers vibes. Um, but they don't quite pull it off just because Woody Harrelson is playing Cletus Cassidy just very bizarrely, where he is just almost too crazy for his own good. And you don't get a clear sense of kind of what the character's goal or motivation is. And they put this other character in the film... Uh, her name was Shriek, they called her, like this uh, this girl who Eddie grew up with at the um, kind of reform home that he was living in, who inexplicably has, like, mutant powers, which they never get into, like, how she has mutant abilities is just sort of, oh, this girl just kind of has powers, it's just, like, accepted in the movie, which I hate when movies do that, where it's like, oh, by the way, this also just kind of happens, there's this girl who has, like, you know, mutant powers, she can scream really loud and, like, hurt, you know, things or whatever. Which is, I think, just it was just a plot device to give some friction between Carnage and Cletus Cassidy because the symbi symbiotes don't like, you know, loud noises. Literally the only reason this character was in the movie and had that power set. But they tried to kind of build up this character of Shriek as like, oh, Cletus wants to get out, wants to reunite with his, you know, long-lost lover and get married and so they can have like a natural-born killers or a Bonnie and Clyde kind of style relationship where they kind of go around causing havoc with their respective abilities. But they really rushed through kind of the whole Cletus Cassidy backstory of in a weirdly like animated sequence where they talk about how he, you know, his heart stopped at birth, but he was revived and he ended up like killing his grandmother and then killing his mother when he was a kid and then got nearly beat to death by his dad and put in the reform home. And then Cletus, towards the end of the movie, tries to justify it saying like, oh, I was... You only told one side of the story, Eddie Brock. I was abused by my mother. I was abused by my grandmother to try and, like, give reasoning for why Cletus Cassidy became a deranged serial killer and, you know, went nuts. I just didn't get a good sense of, like, the Cletus Cassidy character. And I think that's part of the problem with the 90-minute runtime where, like, I didn't really care at all about the character. I just wanted to see, you know, more of Carnage. I didn't care about kind of the man inside of Cletus Cassidy. I didn't care about his relationship with Shriek. I thought the Shriek character just wasn't good at all. It wasn't well uh, performed. The dialogue was really bad that she had. And, like, she ultimately didn't serve, like, a good... Per Again, it was just a plot device to have that ability of, like, she can scream really loud. So that way, like, when Carnage is fighting venom at the end and like she's involved that way there can be friction between carnage and cletus then venom can get the upper hand from there like that was the only reason that character existed in the movie so didn't like that character thought woody harrelson was pretty bad in the movie but uh carnage itself i thought the design of carnage was awesome um and how it flowed and how it moved and how it worked in 
opposition with Venom. I thought they did a good job of clearly kind of showcasing Venom's look and style of fighting and his style of abilities and Carnage's look and style of fighting and style of abilities. Um, I thought they clashed really well with one another. I did like we got a you know a bit of a maximum carnage vibe at the beginning of the movie where you know carnage kind of manifests while Eddie or, while Cletus rather is kind of getting the lethal injection drugs he's on you know death row but then carnage manifests after Cletus bites Eddie and gets like Eddie's blood into his system and I think the combination of like the chemicals and a bit of the symbiote all kind of forms into the carnage kind of disgusting like parasite kind of thing and then he goes crazy throughout the prison i thought that was a cool sequence too of carnage just kind of going nuts throughout the prison and killing guards left and right and just kind of going crazy like the first major scene we see of carnage i thought really worked and again like anytime we see him just kind of doing his own his, his thing and kind of seeing the different ways that carnage kind of moved and was you know wreaking havoc or whatever like that all worked for me and i'm a little bit maybe not annoyed but it sucks that, like, Carnage, basically, like, at the end of the movie, there's the big... They end up in a church because Cletus wants to marry Shriek. So, like, he does this, like, faux kind of wedding thing where he abducts as, like, a, a priest at, like, Carnage Point. And, like, you know, Carnage is, like, you know, spike arm or whatever is, like, forcing this priest to marry the two of them. Venom shows up because Anne is in the church to go save Anne. They have a big fight or whatever. And we get to the end where the symbiote... Uh, becomes unattached from Cletus Cassidy because of Shriek, like, yelling super loudly at a bell. Like, all this stuff kind of happens at one time where the steeple falls down, the bell falls on Shriek, she dies. We never see how Cletus reacts to that. And the symbiote kind of ends up on its own, tries to crawl back to Cletus, but then Venom grabs it and just, like, eats it, which I guess effectively kills it. Um... I don't think Cletus ends up dying, so maybe there's still something on the vine if Carnage does maybe, like, come back at some point, but uh, that symbiote is gone. It would have been cool to see Carnage in some way continue on past this movie. Maybe we get some Carnage in the future because, again, the design was cool, and I'd like to see more of Carnage going forward because it's such an iconic Spider-Man villain, but it seems like that's the end of Carnage for now, and maybe it's for the best because, again, Woody Harrelson wasn't really great in this movie, but... I don't know, we'll see what happens going forward, because seemingly anything is possible, which is what kind of brings us to the end of the movie, so there was also a detective character in this film that was kind of related to the whole Shriek thing, which he didn't really serve that much of a purpose either, I don't know why he was really involved, I guess it was kind of a plot device too, because Eddie gets brought in for questioning at one point after Cletus Cassidy breaks out of prison, or Carnage breaks Cletus out of prison, and Cletus was talking to Eddie, and uh, Eddie discovered all these bodies that, with Cletus' help that Cletus had buried and whatnot. So when Cletus breaks out, Eddie gets brought in for questioning, uh, but that was when he and Venom were separated. Uh, Anne kind of shuttles Venom into the uh, police department to break Eddie out. So then Eddie's kind of on the run after he stops Carnage. He and Venom stop Carnage. Uh, they kind of realize, well, we're fugitives at this point, so we have to just kind of go on the lam. And very odd final scene of the movie where it's like Venom and Eddie just kind of on a beach on some deserted island somewhere, just kind of hanging out, just relaxing, just shooting the shit about how, you know, they are going to be the lethal protector, which they keep bringing that up over and over again, where that was a, you know, in the comics, there was a point where Venom was known as the lethal protector. So they keep bringing that phrase up over and over to kind of say what like venom is in this movie where they fully lean into oh he's like you know this lethal protector and then venom and eddie decide like oh we're gonna be the lethal protector and like they're kind of fa right off into the sunset basically just on the run on this like deserted island like wherever and then we get to the post credit scene which is what i really want like to talk about but long story short with you know kind of the plot summary and what i thought and uh about a lot of the points of the movie we get to the post credit scene which is eddie and venom just kind of in a either a hotel or a cheap apartment somewhere either in Mexico or South America just like somewhere um where Spanish is like the dominant language they're watching like, like a you know soap opera a telenovela or something like that just watching TV just kind of you know shooting the shit just hanging out when all of a sudden like everything around them just starts to like freak out and like change like 
the hotel like they're in changes the location they like everything just kind of morphs and changes around them all of a sudden like out of nowhere like eddie's like looking around like what's going on what's happening like everything just kind of morphs and all of a sudden they're in this new like hotel in this new location and they don't know what's going on and all of a sudden on the tv instead of their telenovela it's jk simmons as j jonah jameson just like we saw in the post credit scene of spider-man far from home and it's the point when jk when j jonah jameson reveals that peter parker is spider-man and on the screen we see tom holland as Spider-Man, it seems like this is the exact point where the Far From Home post credit scene takes place, or at least it's after that point where, you know, J.K. Simmons, or, God, J. Joe Jameson is still, like, you know, keeps bringing it up on the news that, you know, Peter Parker is Spider-Man, like, maybe the story just kind of keeps going for months after the fact, but it's right around that point where the world knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. The MCU world knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And Eddie Brock and Venom are watching this on the TV. As, like, just before, their entire world changed around them. And Venom, like, licks the TV. He looks at Peter and, like, you know, gives them, like, you know, long Venom tongue, like, licks the TV, basically. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Eddie Brock and Venom, from Venom and Venom Let There Be Carnage have ended up in the world of the MCU. I think that is the biggest thing coming out of this movie, which, again, it's weird that, like, you have to sit through this whole movie to get the one scene of, like, actual consequence at the end, but now this movie is of consequence, which I think that's an even bigger conversation, where, like, now, Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock is in the MCU, the Venom character that we've seen from Venom and Venom Let There Be Carnage is now in the MCU. And whatever happens seemingly in Spider-Man uh, No Way Home, because we see in the, the trailer for No Way Home, we see Alfred Molina's Doc Ock, we hear the Willem Dafoe Green Goblin laugh and see a pumpkin bomb. Also in Whatever Happens with the Doctor Strange spell, somehow also brought Eddie Brock from, I guess, like the Ven- I don't get we're going to call it the Venom universe maybe? I don't know. But from, like, that Venom universe, that also, he also gets morphed and brought into the MCU to ultimately, at some point, probably have a showdown with Tom Holland and Spider-Man. Which is wild when you sit and think about it. Because this Sony-Spider-Man relationship has been so, like, weird and kind of contentious and, you know... They didn't have a deal at one point, then they restructure a deal, and they're still kind of sharing spider-man as a character between sony and the mcu and now they're also sharing venom between sony and the mcu so it seems like this relationship is even stronger at this point and is going to continue forward and now it's a question of okay is just everything going to be canon now like with the mcu like what is canon what is not going to be canon because now at this point you kind of have to consider you have to consider venom and Venom Let There Be Carnage as canon with the MCU because the Eddie Brock character from those movies is now in the MCU. He got transported into the MCU. So, I guess we'll see what happens with the, like, the Raimi trilogy Spider-Man characters. If they are those versions from the Sam Raimi movies or if they are just, you know, variants from different universes, but it is still those, like, actors playing them. Because if it ends up, like, you know, the only character confirmed in No Way Home that we know of for sure is Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2. So if that is the actual, the actual Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2, so then that means that those films would also become canon with the MCU. (laughs) Which this opens up just a massive can of worms at this point of, like, so is everything just going to be canon at this point? because we're doing the multiverse stuff and like we've opened up that concept as a whole so are is everything the other kind of outside mcu movies is it fair game to bring some of those elements into the mcu through the guise of oh it's a multiverse so like those universes are multiverses in the overall kind of mcu world because if so that's just going to make things super messy like in a way it 
kind of makes things less messy because you don't have as many like offshoot films where like oh we have you know those old school spider-man movies but like oh they're not like mcu and like now we have these new like venom movies like before it's like oh they're not mcu or whatever but it's still like in association with marvel is what it says at the front of you know like this movie is always like oh in association with marvel and they have the old school like marvel kind of comic flipping pages logo as opposed to the marvel studios logo and that can make things just kind of confusing for the layman where it's like, oh, all these, you know, Marvel movies are the same is what, you know, kind of the average audience goer would think. But now they are kind of starting to all be the actual same. So it makes things less messy in a way, but also more messy when it comes to, okay, now you have to consider Venom and Venom Let There Be Carnage as at least adjacent to the MCU, not like directly as part of the MCU because that the events of those two movies happen in their own universe but they have to also then be considered just like those movies are part of the mcu multiverse and i think that's what's gonna have to turn into is you know what films are part of the mcu multiverse what other franchises are part of the mcu multiverse which it might end up the three raimi spider-man films and then also the two venom movies like those are two universes that are part of the overall mcu multiverse along with the universe where T'Challa is Star-Lord, the universe where Doctor Strange Supreme happens and he, like, destroys that whole universe, the universe where Hank Pym goes, like, everything we're seeing in What If, basically, like, those are all universes in the MCU multiverse. And then, now officially, we're getting our first, like, live-action version of that where the Venom movies are now part of the MCU, like, multiverse. Those two movies happen in a universe that is adjacent to the universe of the MCU, and now the Eddie Brock character, the Tom Hardy Eddie Brock, has been plucked from that universe and has been placed into the MCU. So, the again, the most interesting part of the movie and the thing with the most, like, future consequences is that post credit scene. Which is wild that, again, we're taking that Tom Hardy, like, that Tom Hardy, Eddie Brock, Venom, that character, that relationship, and pushing it into the MCU. And what's going to be interesting moving forward is, you know, obviously Venom is a main and iconic antagonist of Spider-Man. But in the two Venom movies, especially in Let There Be Carnage, great effort was taken to make Venom, like, a goofball. Like, a comedic, goofy kind of character. The relationship between Eddie and Venom is not, like, they're not antagonists in any way in those two movies. Like, Eddie Brock as a character is not, like, a bad guy. He's, like, a, he's a good dude kind of an asshole in some ways but like overall he's not like an evil person like he does the right thing more often than not so i'm curious what's gonna have to happen to put spider-man and venom on opposite sides because it's gonna be hard not to see venom as just like you know a goofball who like weird like goofy alien who just wants to like eat everything he sees and then eddie brock has to like talk him down and like yell at him or whatever like how tom hardy plays this character which is still like really weird how tom hardy plays eddie brock but, like, seeing that up against, like, Tom Holland on screen together, that's going to be really weird unless they tweak Eddie a bit. Or something happens to Eddie where he gets a little bit more, like, evil, a little more antagonistic. Maybe Venom, on the other hand, gets a little bit more kind of evil in his own right and, like, takes more control over Eddie. If they're going to have Spider-Man and Venom go up against each other which i think that's where the ultimate money is in the future is now that this is a possibility you can have a spider-man versus like venom movie and i think they can be its own movie really like you don't have to shoehorn a whole bunch of other stuff in there you can have like a spider-man 4 down the line or have the like spider-man versus venom at some point like a, a massive like mcu sony crossover which maybe that's coming up because now you have like two venom headline movies i think you can do a film called like spider-man versus venom and like it could be huge. Um, but something's going to have to be done to, like, make the Venom character an actual antagonist as opposed to what he is now, which is, again, just kind of a, a doofus, basically. <laughs> who A mindless, just kind of alien who's kind of goofy and, like, just says ridiculous things all the time and just wants to eat, you know, people. Um, I'm so curious where this goes from here. And now, if Venom is going to be in Spider-Man No Way Home... Because that's obviously still coming up in, you know, less than three months. We have No Way Home coming out. And there's all these rumors and speculation about, oh, we're going to end up getting, like, a Sinister Six possibly in that movie with 
Um, Alfred Molina's Doc Ock, uh, Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin, Jamie Foxx's Electro, possibly uh, the Thomas Hayden Church Sandman, and then um, the Lizard from Amazing Spider-Man 1. And so now it's like, if you have those five, which again, that's all the rumor and speculation is that those five are going to be in the movie. If you do a Sinister Six, who's the sixth? Um, it could be, you know, Vulture, if Michael Keaton pops back up at some point. You know, he was kind of redeemed in the end of Homecoming in a way. Um, if you do Mysterio, which I think is a possibility where Mysterio didn't actually die, because you can uh, yada yada that away with, you know, the nature of that character and all the drones and all the nonsense you did with that character in Far From Home. I think you can find a way to bring that character back and say, like, oh, he didn't actually die at the end of Far From Home. Uh, so I think Mysterio is a possibility. Um, and then now Venom. Like, Venom now is a very real possibility because, again, that character is now in the MCU. After whatever happened at the end of this movie, if that was caused by uh, Doctor Strange, or if that was caused by uh, Sylvie killing uh, He Who Remains at the end of Loki, if that caused somehow Eddie Brock to... Uh, like morph into the MCU timeline like regardless that character is now in the MCU so now it is a possibility that Eddie Brock could show up in uh, No Way Home either like in the film itself or maybe even in a post credit scene we even get like a meeting or a chance like encounter between like Eddie Brock and Peter Parker where maybe like I don't know it ends up where Peter Parker maybe does end up, like, making amends with J. Jonah Jameson, or they come to some sort of agreement where he does end up working for this new version of the Daily Bugle, and then Eddie Brock comes up because he's a journalist and then also becomes part of, I don't know, like, maybe they meet at some point just, like, in human form, and that's, like, the big post credit scene of No Way Home is you get Peter Parker and Eddie Brock meeting. You get Tom Holland and Tom Hardy meeting at the end of that movie. Um, it's, again, it's a possibility. Like, now, like, the possibilities are endless, basically, with this character, and I'm just so interested to see where it goes, and I'm interested to see how that tone of Venom meshes with the tone of the MCU, because, quite honestly, the two Venom movies, if you want to rank them in, like, the entirety of the MCU, are gonna, are towards the bottom of quality. They're down there with, like, Thor the Dark World, um, really just that, like, I, I, I think the rest of the MCU movies are, I think, def absolutely better than the two Venom movies, Thor the Dark World is the only one that's maybe, like, on that kind of level. It's, I feel like Thor the Dark World is better than those two, but it's, like, that's where, kind of, the Venom movies, in my opinion, would be down that far if you have if you want to rank them with the entire the, the MCU. But, again, that's what the whole can of worms is going to be now going forward, is, like, what do you consider canon, what's not canon, and how does this all progress moving forward? A lot of interesting and exciting possibilities after the end of this movie. I'm just interested to see what ends up happening and what even more may happen in the future with these Sony properties, because we're still waiting on this damn Morbius movie to come out, where it's been delayed, delayed, delayed forever, and in that trailer, in the most, the last Morbius trailer that came out before the pandemic hit and everything started getting delayed, the very last scene was Morbius interacting with Michael Keaton's character from seemingly from Spider-Man Homecoming. So... And there's, like, a poster of Spider-Man, but it's, like, the Raimi suit as well of, like, Spider-Man. So there's definitely, like, Spider-Man connections in the Morbius movie as well. And now it's a matter of, was well, that movie going to be connected? Now, like, you just, that one scene of, like, oh, Michael Keaton's in this at some point. That makes that movie must-see. To see, like, it, and now especially with this Venom post credit scene, is just everything going to be connected at this point? So, like, again, I... And now even more excited. This movie has made me just even more excited for No Way Home in December, which I think that movie is going to be massive. I think there's going to be a lot of surprises, a lot of possibilities. Still, you know, rumor and speculation about if Toby and Andrew are going to be in there as, you know, their versions of Peter. I think it's probably going to happen, but there might be some, I don't know, possibly more surprises in store. Who knows? But I think just the future and the possibilities and all the stuff with, like, the multiverse is just getting so expansive and there's so many different storytelling possibilities between you know the end of what if next week and then no way home in december obviously doctor strange coming up in march again we're less than six months away from multiverse of madness uh and i don't know maybe eternals like 
uh, somehow Eternals might factor into some of this stuff as well, possibly, but that's still coming out between now and then. So there's so much to look forward to going forward when it comes to like just the implications after this post credit scene of Let There Be Carnage. So again, overall, uh, on the movie itself, it was fine. Not fantastic, not like great, but not terrible. Like, and again, only 90 minutes, so it's not going to be a complete waste of time. Just, you know, go on like a Friday night if you have nothing going on and just go, just see, you know, Let There Be Carnage. And I think once word gets out about this post credit scene even more, once more and more people are starting to see it, I th- I'm interested to see if that really does help, like, the box office of this movie. The word of mouth of, oh, like, you have to go see this movie because it's connected to the MCU. If that work gives, like, gets out and kind of goes around, I'm curious just how many people will, just out of their own curiosity, go see this movie literally just for that post credit scene. I think this is, like, again, the first time that we are going to see, like, a movie purely driven by a post credit scene. And because of its affiliation back to the MCU. Unfortunately for this movie, I don't think anyone is going to remember anything about what actually took place in those 90 minutes. From, you know, the opening scene to Eddie and Venom on a beach. Everything in the middle there, unfortunately for this movie and everyone who worked on it, a lot of that is just going to get lost, like, to history. Because and all anyone is going to remember is that post credit scene, which is one of the most... Uh, influ- not influential, but one of the biggest in comic book movie history where you are getting now the integration between other Sony characters and the larger MCU. And because the MCU is the biggest franchise in the world, any even slight relation to the MCU I think is going to boost Let There Be Carnage. And it's all just from that post credit scene. So a lot of this movie I think is going to end up just being forgotten. Except for people who just want to laugh at, you know, Venom at a rave filled up, like, filled with glow sticks. Um, And hopefully (laughs) the MCU can use that character, make it a little less, you know, goofy, and integrate it seamlessly into the actual MCU, into a true, like, into a Spider-Man story. And maybe we do, I think that's going to happen in the next, you know, few years, is we get a movie that is titled, like, Spider-Man vs. Venom. Or Spider-Man something something Venom. Like, those two names are going to be in the title because those are two now established franchises. And, like, that crossover, I think it is just going to be called Spider-Man versus Venom. I think that be, would be huge. So, overall, those are my thoughts on Venom Let There Be Carnage. Again, a movie that I was not planning to see. A movie I was not looking forward to seeing. Uh, again, some good stuff in it. But, overall... It just kind of is there. Like, it fits in really well, I think, with, like, the early 2000s, like, malaise of all those superhero movies with, like, your... The early Spider-Man films, Daredevil, Ghost Rider, Hulk, Punisher, Fantastic Four, just the the glut we got between, like, the first X-Men movie up into, like, Iron Man. Like, the 2000 to 2007 era of mainly, I guess, like, the Marvel properties that were made in that era where a lot of it was just kind of goofy and just, like, not great. Um, Let There Be Carnage, I think, is with, like, a lot of those types of movies, but still not a terrible time, and I think, again, the most exciting part is just the implications for the future of the MCU going forward, because now this movie is consequential because it is connected to the MCU, so, uh, those are my thoughts on Venom, Let There Be Carnage, uh, if you have your own thoughts or you want to discuss a little bit more about, you know, the implications of that post credit scene, what you thought overall of the movie, your thoughts on Venom now being in the MCU, uh, comment below, I'd like to, you know, love to have a discussion with folks who check out this review and want to talk a little bit more, expand on some of the ideas that I talked about, uh, like this video if you like my thoughts on Let There Be Carnage, if you, uh, want to hear any more of my thoughts on any other superhero properties coming up comic book properties coming up um maybe some other movies there's a lot coming out in october um halloween kills is on a few weeks big halloween fan so maybe i'll do a video on that um no time to die the last james bond daniel craig film is a possibility as well a uh, dune comes out in a few weeks um but for sure i will be back next week with a video on the what if season finale um very excited about that one um, possibly a video in a few weeks on the Titans season three finale, because that's a show that I 
am interested in talking a little bit more about and kind of diving into what I thought of this season. DC Fandom is coming up in a few weeks. Eternals is coming up. It's only like five weeks away now from Eternals, which is pretty wild. Um, No Way Home again in less than three months, which I'm just even more excited now. Again, like I said before, for Spider-Man No Way Home. Hawkeye, Book of Boba Fett. There's so much coming out in the next few months. So uh, if you want to keep up to date with all my thoughts on all this stuff, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Uh, Like, comment, do all that fun stuff. Share everything that everyone tells you to do on this uh, on this platform. But uh, again, those are my thoughts on Venom Left to Be Carnage. Let me know what you think, and I look forward to talking to you guys some more about What If Season 1 finale coming out next week and everything else coming out in the next few months. So thanks much, and we'll talk to you next time.